Keep your Bibles open there to John. These words that Jesus is praying here, if you look at the context from verse 20, he says that, I do not pray for these alone. These alone, who's he talking about? He's talking about his disciples. So he's not praying at this point for his disciples only, but he's praying also for those who will believe from the testimony of his disciples. All the way till he comes again. So he's praying for his church all the way to the second coming. So when he prays this prayer, do you realize that he's praying for you personally today? Amen. Is this an important prayer? Yes. When you're 20 and you look that life is going to last for a long time. And when you're 20 years old, seems like nothing, nothing is impossible for you. That you're, can't be hurt. Okay? Jesus has come to the end of his ministry and the end of his life. Do you know how old he was? Okay? He was still a young man. When you come to the end of your life, are you able to see what priorities should really be important at that point? Right? Isn't the end of your life give you a whole better, clearer vision of what really is important? Amen. So if Jesus has come to the end of his life, don't you think that the last words are very important? Amen. So in this prayer... Who is he praying for? He's praying for you. And he's praying for me. And what is he actually praying for us when he's making this prayer? Well, let's read and we'll see. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be what? One. One. He's praying for the unity of his church. Jesus prayed these words during the final hours of his life. As death drew near, he focused on a single concept of paramount importance. Now, you ever wonder why Jesus prayed these specific words for us to be one? You ever wonder why he didn't pray for you to be happy? Think about it. These are his last words, and he's praying for his church. And he did not pray for your happiness. Nor did he pray for your rights to always be safe and secure, did he? What he prayed for is that you would be one. What kind of unity was he talking about? Any ideas? One in spirit. Say it louder, Gary. One in spirit. One in spirit? I like that. Anybody else? Now, let me ask you, before you give me time to think about this. Did God create a diverse humanity? Yes. And do we lose our diverseness when we come and join this church? No. So this oneness that Jesus is praying for isn't a oneness that we all look the same, talk the same, speak the same, or even think the same. Right? So, if it's not that kind of oneness, how do we have oneness? And that's the problem with the church. Because it only comes one way. Do you know what that way is? The way, the truth, and the life. If you want the oneness that Jesus prayed for here in this prayer in John, you can only have it by having Jesus dwell inside your hearts. And you can only have the oneness in the church when the church as a corporate body represents his character. Amen. Right? Amen. It's not a oneness that you see scripture the same way I do. It's not a oneness that you have given up everything I've given up. Okay? It is a oneness that allows me to put your need and your betterment in front of my own. 
It is a oneness that shows me that you are more important than I am. And that in your eyes, I'm more important than you are. It is a oneness that looks out for the betterment of the other person. When you have that oneness, that oneness will put to death the selfishness of the flesh and all of our pettiness. Do you know what that word petty means? Insignificant. Smallness. Smallness. Right? We are a very small, small race of people. Okay? And we can be very petty at times. And we bring that pettiness into the church. But Jesus has come to give us freedom from that pettiness. Uh, Ricky, in your staff school today, uh, what did you talk about? What was the class about? The law. The law. In grace. In grace. And in that, I heard that somebody said that we are free from the law. And what they said was true. That in Christ, you're free from the law. But what does that actually mean? That we're free to do whatever we want and to sin? No. Do you realize that only fallen sinful creatures would think that way? Yeah. If you ask an angel that has not fallen what it meant to be free from the law, he would give you the right answer. And that is, well, in Christ there's no condemnation. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is holy, just, and good because the law is a representative of God's character, right? There's nothing wrong with the law. What's wrong with the law is us. It is in our weakness that the law has become a problem. Why? Because the law can do nothing but condemn us. Do you understand that? But through Christ, it is put in its proper place. It is no longer a tool of condemnation, but it is something that shows us who and what God is. Amen. That God is not a murderer. God is not a liar. Amen. God does not lust or covet. Amen. God does not swear. God loves. Right? Amen. That is what the law is. It shows us who and what God is. How do you worship God when it comes to the law? What does the law tell you about how you worship God? Well, you look at the first four commandments, and that's how you relate to God, the way God wants you to relate to Him. Is that right? Now, how do you worship, or not worship, but how do you relate to your fellow men? Well, that's the other six. You ever wonder why it only takes four to be able to worship God, but it takes six to get along with each other? Amen. Jesus says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one, what? So this oneness that Jesus was talking about is a oneness that he has with his Father and that he wants us to have with him. And that only comes when we have the type of relationship that Jesus had with his Father. Can we have that? Yes. Jesus said, I do nothing of myself. Is that right? Yes. But what I do, I do because the Father has told me. Everything I say, I get from the Father. These great works that I do, the miracles, I do through the power of the Father. Amen. And Jesus calls us to have that same relationship with Him. And that, that relationship with Him is how we would have a relationship with each other. Right? So, understand, brothers and sisters, that when you hear the Sabbath school teacher say that without Christ, you can do it. Nothing. You understand what that means? <coughs> that means that without Christ, you can do nothing. Amen. That is good. The Bible says that your righteousness outside of Christ is what? Do you understand? That means the best that humanity has to offer. The best. Not, not the worst. The best that humanity has to offer outside of Christ, in God's eyes, is filthy rags and worth. Nothing. Amen. Amen. You will not ever have unity and love, the kind of love that God talks about, 
unless you have the living Christ inside your heart. And you will only know that you have that when you're able to look at your brother as being better than you. That you're more concerned with their welfare than your own. Where you're more concerned with listening to what they say than telling them your opinion. Amen. That they all may be one as you father in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you what? What's the most important part of that last sentence? There's one word, and you got a key into that word. What is it? There you go. You understand that? How is the world to believe that Jesus was sent by God the Father? Through the oneness that you find in the unity of his church. Do you understand what that meant? That meant that Jesus staked his entire reputation on who he is and what he is on you and me getting along. Yes. Does that start to sink into the importance of unity within the church? On being able to get along with each other? What's that? All. All. Oh. You ever wonder why Jesus didn't pray that you would always be happy or that you would never suffer or that your rights would always be defended? Jesus prayed that his followers would get along with one another. Now, how important is this kind of unity to Jesus? As I said, it is so important that he tied his reputation and his credibility to this one message. Do you guys understand that? What did Jesus say? You will know them by the love they have for what? For each other. So if Jesus was to come into this church today, what kind of grade would we get? I asked you that last week. Now, brothers and sisters, last week I told you was probably the strongest sermon that I ever preached to you. But it had to be preached. There are a lot of people here thinking, I have no idea what he's talking about. And that's okay. But there are people here who know exactly what I'm talking about. And then there are people here who don't want to even think about what I was talking about. Amen. And those are the people that really need to hear what is being spoken. Amen. Do you realize that Jesus trusted his entire credibility to you? Here, here's an even uh, scarier thought. He trusted that credibility to me. Okay? You realize the responsibility that you carry when you use that name Christian? I mean Christian. And you come together in fellowship? The book of Hebrews tells us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some of you have been in the habit of doing. Is fellowship important? Yes. yes. And yet, we fellowship, but sometimes we don't get along. Now, let me ask you, what is another word for the church? It starts with an F and ends with a Y. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Now, how many of you, I want you to raise your hands after I finish this question. How many of you came out of a family that always got along, that never argued, that never had dissension, that had peace and unity the entire time you've been part of that family. Raise your hand. No, you're not looking for liars. <laughs> now look around. Like, raise your hand. Because ain't nobody here raising their hand. That was good English, wasn't it? They taught me that. So listen, understand that when we come into the church, it's going to be the same way. When you come into the church, you're coming into a family, right? right, right. And you're coming to, into a family of human beings, is that right? Yeah. And with that, we bring our humanness, is that right? Yes. And so, listen. Jesus told Nicodemus that you must be what? You must be born again to be saved. Now, Paul elaborates on that when he says that the spirit fights against the flesh and the flesh fights against the spirit. So when you are born again, 
Does it take that fallen human nature totally away? It is a battle inside of you, is that right? Yes. And that one of those natures is trying to, to have the supremacy. Yes. Whether it's your born again nature that loves God, that has Jesus living in your heart, or whether it's that carnal nature that puts you on the throne. Your selfishness and all that comes with it. So within the church, now we come into a group that either acts like they have the born-again spirit, or they really do. There's only two choices you have in the church. There's only two types of people you'll have here. Ones that have the spirit, and one that act like they have the spirit. The question is, is which one of you are you today? Do you realize that you can be both in a matter of moments? Right? And it's a battle. This is why submission is so important. Isn't that right, Gary? Yeah. Right? And that's what this is about, is submitting your heart and your life to Christ. But it's something that has to be done sometimes on a second-to-second -second basis. Because I can be in total submission right now. And ten minutes from now, I may not. That's why we keep talking about choice and that God gave you the freedom to choose and this is why the Bible says over and over again from Old Testament to New Testament here's one of my favorite verses choose ye this day whom you will what? what does that word serve mean if you go back and look at it from a concordance slave I heard that word and that's exactly what it is you understand? Choose ye this day who you will be a slave to. Either to God or to the devil. That is your only two choices. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Who owns you now? Jesus. And if Jesus doesn't own you, then the devil does. Constant submission throughout all the time that you live here on this planet, day by day. But listen, do you not understand that in Christ, that submission is not a duty, it is a joy. And it is a privilege. I did not know true freedom until I found slavery in Christ. Paul said, I am a bond servant. What's the word bond servant mean? You owe someone. Okay? And, and, and you owe Christ a debt you'll never repay. Paul also used the word that he was a slave to Christ. I want you to understand this concept because in our day and age, we don't understand that the way the biblical writers do find it. There's nothing wrong with that. That is our problem today. We want to make sure that our freedoms are protected. Because we're Americans. But, yeah, that's right. That's right. But listen, individual freedom, the thing that this country was raised on, is not biblical. You guys understand that, right? God is not concerned with your individual freedom because it's individual freedom that leads to selfishness. Individual freedom that the Founding Fathers wanted only works when a people are submitted to their God. Because I will look out for your freedom and you will look out for my freedom. This is why we today are so concerned in this church about religious liberty. Okay, so... How important is unity to Jesus? He tied his reputation and credibility of his message to how well his followers would display unity and oneness. Turn with me to John 17, which we're there. But if you're not, John 17, let's look at verses 1 through 19. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. 
And this is eternal life, that they may what? Know the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you, Father, have sent. Jesus says, I have glorified you on this earth, and I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have, sure, and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. What's the difference between who he's praying for and the world? Who is the world that he's talking about? Do you understand what I said earlier? Either you submit yourself to God, or you're going to submit yourself to the devil. There is no, there is no middle ground there. There is no straddling that fence. It's one or the other. You're either with Christ or you're against Him. So with Christ, as He's praying here, you understand that He's praying for those who have accepted Him in His day, and who will come in the future and accept Him. Those who take His name, who have come out of the world and have been separated. They have been sanctified. They have been made holy. They have been made one. One. Pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 10, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified. How? Amen. How is Christ glorified? He's glorified in you. How your brothers and sisters in the church relate to you and you to them, and how the world sees that is how Christ is glorified. When they see the love that God has coming from us to each other, they will glorify God. Yes, Ray? The true test of Christian character is our love for the brother. Amen. Amen. Verse 11. I, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except that one, the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have what? Christ's joy. This is why the Christian walk is not unpleasurable. It's not, it's hard. Okay? It's hard, but it's not, what would be the word? That's the opposite of, of of not having joy. A burden. A burden, yeah, there you go. It's not a burden, nor is it unbearable. Listen. Nor is it solitary. Christ calls you to a life that is hard. He said, in this world you will have persecution. If the world hated me, what are they going to do to you? But Christ said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And that the joy he has, he gives to us so that our joy may be full. He said, I come to give you life and give it to you what? More abundantly. You get a big reward card. <laughs> I like that. I like that, Gary. 
what's the verse that uh, he says, come to me that are all heavenly laden, and the rest, I don't remember the rest of it, but that's... Come know, to me all that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest, right. rest for your soul, your soul. But understand that there is joy in having Christ live inside of you. Mm -hmm. we, we can Do you want to know what that joy is? You're going to see it today and tomorrow. For today, at 2 o'clock, we go to a memorial service. The Bible says to weep with those who weep, and then tomorrow we come to a wedding. Brothers and sisters, containing those two things is the entire circle of life.